Hey, good morning, good morning, my brothers and my sisters. Happy Monday morning, chill. Uh, you can see the altar of the church of the Church Town Church of God. I forgot to change the paraments yesterday. They're still white. I was informed of that after the service, of course. How many times does that happen to you, my pastor friends? You go through a service and you're just like, oh my goodness, you know, everything is clicking. This is amazing. Everything is on. The Holy Spirit is just rocking this place. As soon as you're done, someone says, you know what? Your collar was up. It's been bugging me the whole service. You didn't change the pyramids. I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. There we go. There we go. There's your church. Nobody's on. But I was here a little bit early. I was uh, setting things up. We were rocking yesterday here. We had the guitar plugged in. Funny thing is, I had the guitar plugged in. We were playing all of our worship songs and having a good time. Um, but my microphone was never turned on. <laughs> it was hilarious. So I, my voice is actually a little scratchy today because my microphone was never turned on. You know, why don't we open with a prayer? Good morning, Dale. And we say, Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for every day. Lord, we love you so much. We love you so much and we give ourselves to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for all that you are, all that you have done, all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Good morning, Rick. I hope you're doing well. Missed you yesterday. So many people, including so much family with this crud. The crud. Is there another name for this stuff than the crud? The crud. Everybody's got the crud. And I mean, there is an illness, right? There is a flu part. I know that dear Bryn had the flu part. There is this weird hard cold aspect of it, like super head cold on steroids. And then there is just this lingering crud. Like what is going on? What's wrong with the human race? I feel sickly. Really? I mean, I feel sickly. I, I'm never sick. Good morning, Sharon. Um, but no, I actually don't feel bad. I just have this crud still. Good morning, Rick. How are you feeling? Is everybody doing okay? I'm just looking at everybody, saying hello to everybody. We had a, quite a morning yesterday, as I indicated. Quite a morning. And no, the person, the person who told me about the paramounts um, was my wife. She said, after the service, I told you to change them. I'm like, honey, why, you can change them. I, I got a lot on my mind. You know what I'm saying? Uh, especially when, because I really wanted to. This was not a burden in any way, shape, or form. I really wanted to play the guitar and help lead worship. Uh, it's been a long time, so I was up here banging away on the guitar. But that's a lot, right? When you're, you've got the scriptures, and you've got your sermon, and you've got all of the you know, things that people have said to you leading up to the church service, uh, the various prayers and prayer requests and where everybody is that day. I don't know what it's like in your context, but I... I like that. Like people, you know, my Saturdays and Sundays, I get a lot of messages. Pastor, you know, here's where we are. Here's what is happening. Sometimes it's, hey, we've decided to take a couple days, so don't worry about us. You know, we're dra traveling or, you know, we're not well. And I like that. <coughs> <coughs> the crud. So, you know, there's a lot going on. Um, and I didn't change the colors up there, so... Hi, Liz. But we did talk about, we've been talking about some interesting uh, topics here at Churchtown. Um, you know, there, there has been a preaching element of every week. And that preaching element, you know, doesn't change, right? The life, the death, the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, the, Kingdom of God on earth, now the kingdom of God to come. Preach it. But there has also been then this teaching element that has been very strong these past few weeks. And the, the premise has been 
as we talk about here all the time. What do we believe and why do we believe it? And I am just convinced that in the church today, we've got to go there and we've got to go deeply into God's word and people who attend church regularly should understand not only what they believe, but why they believe it. That is when discipleship happens. That is when evangelism happens. Good discipleship and good evangelism. We read all throughout scriptures. One of the points that I made yesterday was that we read these letters of the New Testament and really uh, oftentimes, good morning, really in the back of our minds, we're thinking that's not us, that's them. Well, the first thing that we may think is that it doesn't relate to the church. Stop. They're written to churches. Okay? And then still we're thinking, well, that was then, this is now, that was them, it doesn't apply to me. It's specifically written to you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Things that we must pay attention to. The teaching and the preaching of Jesus Christ was to his circle first, his apostles, right? And then to the world. We look upon his ascension, right? To Judea, Samaria, and all the world. I mean, it goes out in these concentric circles, so to speak. And it begins, and the New Testament is all about the church. So many folks are like, well, I don't need to go to church. And, or, you know, the church, you don't go to church, you are the church, this and that. The New Testament is about the church, right? It's, it's, we ignore that to our peril. And so we, we, we talk about these things and not only about these things, but the significance of these things. We, during um, Christmas, Advent time, Christmas time, Advent, talked an awful lot, as always, right, about the incarnation of the Christ, the first coming, if you will, of Jesus Christ. We spoke about who Jesus is in relative to even Genesis 1, the word, the, the word of God, the creative of God. Um, you notice I didn't... Act, intentionally add a noun to that because what do you say but he's the creative of God God speaks and things come into existence we know this and we learn this in John 1 when the word was God and the word was with God and the word was God and through him all things were created without him nothing was created all of that stuff and then the word this creative became flesh and dwelt among us so we, we talked an awful lot about that, and we talked an awful lot then the last couple weeks of Advent about the second coming, Revelation 21, 22, coming from the clouds and the, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth in our glorified bodies and no sun and no moon and how incredible and different it's going to be and it's going to be Edenic. We talked about from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Eden, the way things should be. <coughs> And so last week, we kind of filled in the blanks. And we talked about Matthew 24, Acts chapter 1. Barbara, if you check in later, thank you for that. It's in Corinthians. It's in Thessalonians. It's all over the place about what will happen and what it will look like when Jesus comes again. And we talked about our Christian worldview, that this is not end times. This is a transitional period. The old dies. I mean, we see this through the cycle of life. We see this through the life and times of Jesus Christ. We see this through, right? Old Testament to New Testament, Old Covenant to New Covenant. We see this over and over and over again. The old will pass and the new will come. So yes, it is the end of history as we know it, the end of time as we conceive of it, the end times for humanity as humanity has been on this planet. But it is this transitional period, if you will. Will it be sunshine and roses? 
I don't think so. Not looking like it. But as we learn through scripture, those who are faithful will endure. Right? And we see that, uh, you know, we, I made a few points, shockingly enough, in the sermon yesterday. But, you know, one of the major... <clears throat> one of the major is those who remain faithful to the end will be saved. How about that for one of those statements that is only six inches wide and eternity deep? So, you know, God in his wisdom and through his wisdom tells us point blank, and this is where we often, I think, as human beings, we, we sort of want more. We want a big 380-page book of God's theology, you know, so we can parse it and we can do all of these different things. He simply says, he gives us an out, you know, information. He gives us not an outline or a timeline, but he gives us information about how we will experience this. And not everybody will experience it the same way. But there are a few things that we can take away. One, we don't know the time or date. Two, when Jesus Christ does return, we will know it. It says, don't go looking for him over here or listening, oh, I'm over here. You, there will be no doubt. So one, we don't know when it will happen. Two, when it does happen, there will be no doubt. Right? Three, when it does happen, there are a variety of different things that humankind will experience. The rise of evil, the rise of temptation and accusation through Satan who is going to fight like crazy. Trials and tribulations and persecution and all kinds of different things for those who are remaining faithful. <coughs> and <coughs> for those who remain faithful, you will be saved. That's, like, that's it. And I know that libraries have been filled with all of the end times stuff and end times the eschatology and this and that. But, he, you know, and he just makes that statement. But those who remain faithful to the end will be saved. I can't do much more for you than that. The question, I guess, is how do you remain faithful? Well, you remain faithful in your prayer life. You remain faithful in your time with the word. You remain faithful in your committed relationship to God through Jesus Christ. How do you do that? That's, you, you know how to do that. You know how to do that. So it's important. Scripture is full and Jesus' teachings are full of, you know, keeping the light on, keeping oil in the lamp, being vigilant. You know, he says, good morning, Michelle. If you knew that a burglar was breaking into your home at a certain time, you would be there to defend it. So be ready anytime. Jesus himself teaches, do not fear one who can ca kill your body. Fear the one who can kill body and soul and cast you into hell. Oh, we don't want to preach that in the churches, man. Not too many people will come. Then so be it. You go and preach what you need to do. You go and preach your best life now. You know, hell is lined with people that have good intentions. But did not live the truth. I know. So there we go. Woo! How about that for Monday morning chill? Give you something to think about? I hope so. I think we need something to think about. I think we need something to pray about. <clears throat> I think we need to understand the significance of the word more and more and more through this journey I have been on. It, and I know this sounds naive, but it comes back to the word, the word, the word, the word of God, word, the spoken word. You know, and even the word of God is full of the, about the word of God, preaching and teaching the word of God, having the word of God, reading, studying, interpreting, understanding the word of God. When we look in the word of God, we see the creative of the word of God. 
we see Jesus Christ as the Logos, the Word of God, the Word, 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 boom, boom, I'm being bombarded with that. And you just get there. You open your Bibles and you get there and you stay there. And you ignore or you fight against or you at least at the very least recognize Right when the Satan, right the accuser, starts telling you things, and and one of the immediate red flags is, eh, just turn your eyes away from the Word of God. That was Garden of Eden stuff, and that is still his greatest lie and temptation and accusation, accusing God of being unloving, accusing God of being a bigot accusing God of being a fill-in-the-blank, the accuser. And we watch churches, hello, United Methodists, just divide over it. And Satan is just like, yeah. Let me wreck this place from the inside out, baby. And it just makes you weep. Oh. There we go. There we go, there we go. That's it, that's what I got. God is doing amazing things this Monday morning. God is. It is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. We, the the church, have to take a stand on this evil in opposition toward the umber. Oh, I didn't know that it was Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. How do you learn things like that? How do we know that it is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday? I, I, I'm, I'm, again, I, maybe I just have blinders on to church life outside of this place or the people that I serve. Um, some, I, you know, for the first, I think, five years of my existence, I totally missed World Communion Sunday. I didn't, no, I didn't know there was such a thing coming into this. You never taught that as you, you never taught that when you're trained to be a pastor. You're never, you know, I, I, we've talked about the church calendar before. I know very little about the church calendar. I've never had a desire to study it per se. Um, it was never introduced to me as I went through seminary and Bible studies. Um, and so what little I've learned of it and that sort of thing. So I do, I, I go through these things and I learn stuff. Okay, well, Angie, also the family and friends of the donor. Dear Lord, we do pray for Angie, liver transplant. Oh, Lord, you're working through modern science. Michelle knows that as well as anybody. And Lord, thank you for this opportunity for Angie. May you just bless both, all parties involved. Give them the sense of peace. Lord, bring them into health. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, that's that. Oh, well, there you go. That is probably how it has evolved. It evolved. Um, I don't know, Logan. We're not going to be doing anything uh, uniquely special for that. Um, We kind of preach that every week or as often as the opportunity arises when we talk about what it means to be a healthy human and to understand healthy human decisions, healthy human sexuality, what it means to be healthy human relationships, those sorts of things. The sanctity of human life, I preach, of course, we take every oppor- that we take every Christmas and Advent season. Mary, I hope you're feeling better. Christmas and Advent season to preach the sanctity of human life. You've heard me preach that before. Um, if you are a Christian and you believe that abortion is okay, then, uh, you know, f- f- there's obviously so much, but I mean, you're, you're, you're believing or you say, well, because it's not really a human being until second trimester, third trimester, viable outside of the womb, whatever your rationale may be. It's not really a human being until you say so is really what it amounts to then you're saying that Jesus Christ, there was a time when Jesus Christ was not a human being. Scripture teaches us otherwise. He was 100% human, 100% divine. And when Gabriel speaks to Mary, 
he makes no mention of. Now be very careful with this little zygote until he becomes a human being. Then he will be Jesus. No, it doesn't work that way. He's Jesus from the moment that those cells divide. So it's very difficult theologically to argue in the case of abortion where you're arguing that there was a time theologically that Jesus was not 100% divine and 100% human. Right? I mean, am I wrong? Right? You're saying, oh, well, yeah, he was maybe 100% divine, but he wasn't human until the second trimester or until Mary said so. And it was, thank heavens, Mary made the choice to have him. Uh, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So anyway, yeah. So there you go. There are some quick thoughts on that. Hi, John. I'm still looking over my Matthew 24 scriptures. That's powerful. Matthew 24 is powerful. Um, and here's, here's, the, uh, here's the ending of Matthew 24. <coughs> <coughs> the crud. You've heard me cough several times. Great gravy. No, no, I, and, and never, ever, ever, Logan. I, I've been exposed, exposed to you? I have been <laughs> exposed to your teaching and your preaching for some time now. Oh, my goodness. You're as solid as solid. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, never, ever, ever would I suggest that, oh, yeah, but, yeah. The, that's a great question. Maybe we can investigate that. I won't be with you tomorrow. I'm on grandchild duty tomorrow, which I will never give up. Hi, Alyssa. I was just saying I won't be with the crew tomorrow. I will be, I'm on grandchild duty tomorrow. I believe I'm having a sleepover with my granddaughter this evening. Um, but we can talk about that. What is the church's responsibility? And we can carry it to social issues. If you are a bit of a Church of God historian and like... I don't know if you call me a historian, but I've read up on Weinbrenner and all those guys and what, what they believed and how they carried themselves right up to and through the Civil War and what they felt about drinking and how they felt about war and all those different issues. We can talk about the so social responsibility of the church today. When is it time to stay in the walls and pray? When is it time to go outside of the walls and act? And how do we act? I think it's a very, very, very good questions. Well, obviously. Um, and we can talk about that. So think of your issues. Right? We all have issues. No, think of what, how you may frame that conversation in a particular issue. We talk about gun control. We talk about abortion. We talk about um, oppressive, tyrannical government. Right? Right? I mean, that's a thing. That's what's persecuting the church around the world. When does the church push back? Ever? Right? Those sorts of things. What about temperance? What about smoking and drinking? And, you know, we allow the, and gambling, which is now almost legal in almost all 50 states. Right? Marijuana is legal all over the place now. All those sorts of things. I mean, it's... it's where, does, where is the church? Should the church simply be ultra-libertarian and say, look, all of your decisions are out there. You know, what we are preaching here in the church is one of them. Or should we step up and say, no, we need to stop that. We need to draw boundaries around that. We need to stop that because it's hurting people. Where's that tension? Those are great questions. Great questions. And is it relative? Is it relative to individual churches or that sort of thing that, that have an opportunity? We can talk about that forever. Great job, Logan. I want to read this to you. I want to read this from chapter, uh, chapter 43, from verse 43, chapter 24 on. These are the things that we neglect or we shy away from preaching in the church. But these teachings of Jesus Christ himself, let alone Paul and John, 
are all over the place. And I, I don't think it's fair to our congregations to leave out these teachings because we, we just talked about making good decisions. You can't make a good decision if you don't have good information. You can't make a good decision if you don't have all of the information. Here's all of the information. And Jesus Christ is not mincing his words. This is the New Living Translation. <clears throat> Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Boom. Got it. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. That's the church. See, now he's breaking into an analogy with the church. We are the servants. We are the servants. We are responsible. And thus, as followers, they are responsible. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth. The master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. Kingdom of God. Oh, inheritance. But, and here, there's where we stop. Say, hey, amen. Woo, in charge of everything. That's me. But, what if the servant is evil and thinks, my master won't be back for a while? Remember, he's talking about the church. The servants of the church. He's not talking about somebody out. Oh, this is when he's talking about the world. Talking about the church. What if the servant is evil? My master won't be back for a while. And he begins beating the other servants. Partying, getting drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected. And he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites in hell. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Does the church ever read that warning to itself? Do we ever look in the mirror and read that and say, which servant am I? Do we understand the big picture of an inheritance of the kingdom of God or being cast into hell? We're not playing around here. You see this? We're not playing around here. We've got to stop playing around. This is serious. <laughs> anyway, maybe I'm too serious, right? Maybe I'm too serious. Societal issues are important, but we are called to live differently than the world. Yeah, there's that tension as well. There's that tension as well. And perhaps some of the strongest testimony that the church can provide is simply understanding holiness, which is the differentness of which you speak, John, and living it, truly living it in our cubicles at work and on the street at work and at play in the playgrounds and in the lines at Walmart, being the holy called people. Why are you not angry? Well, let me, let me share that with you. Why? Right? What do you believe about the sanctity of human life? I've never heard these let me share that with you, right? That perhaps can be the greatest testimony of all because as many great thinkers and even politicians have said, if you want to find out what a person truly believes, don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. I'll leave you with that thought today. Bryn, we've been praying hard for you. Are you still up the street? Sick, in bed with the flu, or are you doing better? Please let me know. Uh, missed you yesterday as well. Missed a lot of people. Like I said, I want this sickness to go away. I want everybody back in church filling up and singing and woo! But I'll be posting the service from yesterday, this morning. Uh, so if you want to 
hear the teaching on Matthew 24 and the end times, which is a bit of a misnomer, then um, it's posted there, and I think it came out pretty well. So, hey, Mary, just getting ready to check out. It's good to hear from you this morning. Talking about a, this is a good conversation this morning. A very good conversation this morning. Exactly. Boom. I mean, that is, that is exactly it. And that saying that we, we kind of throw around probably applies most dramatically and most powerfully to the church, Orthodox Christianity. If you want to find out what this church, this pastor, this board of elders truly believes, don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. Right? Now, we understand as Christians we're called to do both, but you had to go to work today. Oh, my goodness. You sound like so many other young people that I know that you just, you just pound away at work, and uh, I just pray that you're better. That's not a criticism. That's a good thing. I mean, with the work ethic and all of those, that stuff, I guess. When you get older, that changes a little bit. You're like, ah, no, I, the world will keep on spinning. Uh, I'm sick. So God bless you guys. I love you. Father God, thank you so much for this church. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for these thoughts that are coursing through us. Lord, may we look in the mirror every single day. May we look in the mirror every single day, Lord, and understand who we are in Christ. That's what matters. In Jesus' name. God bless you guys. I will talk to you for Wednesday morning word. Amen.